How's it going YouTube? Thanks for watching this video and if you haven't already make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload new and amazing content just like this video. This video in particular is longer than most of my videos as I show you four different towns, Old Shawnee Town, Shawnee Town, Equality, and Harrisburg. Up ahead is the Shawneetown Bridge, which is the only bridge over the Ohio River between Paducah, Kentucky and Evansville, Indiana. That's a distance of about 140 river miles. The bridge opened up in 1955, and something else about this bridge is that it was featured in the movie U.S. Marshals, which was released in 1998. There are actually two Shawnee Towns. There is Old Shawnee Town and New Shawnee Town. Old Shawnee Town is one of Illinois' oldest communities. It is where the original Shawnee Town was constructed. New Shawnee Town was built about three miles inland in response to the Ohio River flood of 1937. The old town is still protected by levees, and the area does sit in a major floodplain as it is located just downstream of the confluence of the mighty Ohio and Wabash Rivers. The land surrounding the area downstream of the confluence is extremely flat and low, which creates a massively sized floodplain. The levees surrounding Old Shawnee Town only works so much as the Old Town still experiences flooding events. On the left is the Shawnee Town Bank. It housed the first bank that was operated in the state of Illinois called the Bank of Illinois. I don't really get a good view of it until later, so think of that as a teaser for what's to come later. There's not much left in this town as floods over the years have caused destruction to many of the homes and other buildings that once occupied this section of grid streets. However, it was mostly due to the flood of 1937. In 1840, Shawnee Town had 1,900 people living here. It basically maintained most of that population until 1920 when the census counted only 1,368 people. In 1940, the count was 1,357. Then in 1950, only 578 remained in what is now known as Old Shawnee Town. Today, 176 people are estimated to still be living in the Old Town. Back to the Ohio River flood of 1937, the flood affected an area from Cincinnati, Ohio to Cairo, Illinois, which is where the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi River is located. The entire southern Illinois region had property damage amounting to more than $75 million, which is equivalent to over $1.2 billion today, as the flood completely drowned out Shawneetown, which forced residents to evacuate to, at the time, a makeshift tent city three miles inland on higher ground. The floodwaters came inland as far as Harrisburg, which we will get to later in this video, and Harrisburg is over 20 miles inland from the nearest point along the Ohio River. On the right is the levee that still stands to protect Old Shawnee Town from minor flooding events, and as you can tell, it's not very tall. Building levees is expensive for governments to build and maintain, which is probably why it hasn't been rebuilt to be taller and stronger. When places were first being discovered west of the original 13 colonies, settlements were almost always founded along rivers or other bodies of water, as western expansion occurred before railroads and automobiles became main sources of transportation. Therefore, the cities that were were located along the banks of navigable rivers, such as the Ohio River, were the cities that thrived. Many river cities have strong histories because of what I had just mentioned, and Shawnee Town is no exception to having a strong history. In fact, Shawnee Town and Washington, D.C. are the only towns to have been chartered by the U.S. government, as Shawnee Town served as a U.S. government administrative center for the Northwest Territory at the time. Lewis and Clark are also believed to have stopped here in 1803 along their westward expedition. Make sure to drop a like for that amazing insight.
As I tried to turn left here, there are two dogs sitting in the middle of the road, so it took me a little bit of time to try and get around them. Censusreporter.org states that the median household income among the 100 or so people that remain in Old Shawneetown is $18,000 per year and that the poverty rate is 74%. Last but not least, the Shawneetown Bank Building has become a landmark for the city. The building was completed in 1841 as Shawneetown was home to the first bank in the state of Illinois. The bank was originally in a log cabin as it opened in 1816, then it moved to a brick building in 1822 called the John Marshall House, and then finally the bank moved to this building that we see here today. The building is the oldest building in Illinois that was built for being a bank specifically, and in 1972 the building was added to the National Register of Historic Places. In 2009, the building was on a list for being one of the top 10 most endangered landmarks in the state. Some renovation happened within the building in the 1970s, and as of today, nobody is allowed inside due to structural safety issues. Make sure to drop a like for that amazing insight.
And now it's time to head over to New Shawneetown. Gallatin County as a whole saw a peak population of 15,800 in the year 1900. Today it is estimated to have only 4,800 people. Salt and coal mining activity was heavy during its peak years, and today there are hardly any jobs to be found. Agriculture is the obvious leading economic activity in this area, and outside of that, there's basically nothing but a couple of old historic towns. The county is a part of the larger southern Illinois region known as Little Egypt. The nickname comes from the fact that southern Illinois is bounded by the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, and that reflects the region in Egypt surrounding the Nile Delta, as both regions have extremely fertile farmland. Just like that, we are in Shawneetown, or I guess you could say New Shawneetown. This is where the tent city was constructed in 1937 for the evacuation of the flood. There are other cities in Illinois and throughout the Midwest that were originally built along riverbanks in floodplains that have also moved their communities further inland in attempts to avoid future floods. The population peaked in 1940 when the town was built as it was home to 1,963 residents. Today, the town is home to 1,120 residents and only saw a population gain in one census count of its entire existence which was in 1970. The median household income is $32,000 per year and 33% of the residents are living in poverty. Those stats are what you can expect in just about any rural isolated town its size throughout not just Illinois but the country as a whole. The closest Walmart or any store of that nature is in Morganfield, Kentucky which is a 20 minute drive east. Shawneetown is the county seat of Gallatin County, and directly to the left is the courthouse. As you can see, the new town has slight rolling hills going through it, and the town is at a higher elevation even though it is surrounded by the Ohio River floodplain. The hills give it protection from flooding events, as once again the confluence of the Wabash and Ohio is not too far north, and you also have the Saline River further west and south that can also flood.
There's really not too much to see here, but you can't tell the story of Old Shawnee Town without showing the new Shawnee Town. It does seem like a nice small town that still has its small town charm, and hopefully the town can try to find a way to reverse the trend of people leaving, as less people means less tax dollars, and less tax dollars means less services. I do worry not only about Shawnee Town, but many other Illinois towns that are losing people as the state imposes extremely high property taxes among all Illinois residents, and that makes it hard to grow an economy and for businesses to operate especially when you have nearby tax-friendly states such as Indiana and Kentucky. It's a recipe for failure, really, and unfortunately, that's what we have been seeing in Illinois, as it has been going on for a long time at this point. And if you don't believe me, or you are in denial, just compare it to nearby states, as you just don't see the same thing happening in small towns in Indiana to the scale that it is happening in Illinois. Next, we will be in a town called Equality. As we make our way into Equality, you can tell that the highway is built a few feet above ground level, and that's due to the massive floodplain that surrounds the area. Equality today is home to an estimated 540 residents, which is down from a 1920 peak population of 1,332 residents. Salt and coal mining helped this town grow in its early years, and it's ironic that this place is named Equality, as in 1838 an illegal slave trader kidnapped free African Americans and housed them five miles on a hill east of town. He made a business out of it, selling what were supposed to be free African Americans back into slavery. Even though Illinois was a free state, it definitely had its southern roots in the rural southern portions of the state. The water tower to me is quite a sight as it is situated on a hill in town and has a street heading towards it in all four directions. Equality is located right off of the Saline River, but since parts of the town are on higher ground, only a small portion of the town has the threat of flash flooding. The median household income here is $36,000 per year, with 21% of the residents living in poverty. Slightly better stats than nearby Shawneetown, but it still goes with what I was saying earlier, as you can expect to see those numbers in just about any isolated small town in this country.
You can see that some of the storefronts in downtown are boarded up while others are still in use. It's pretty common to find extremely narrow streets just like the one that we're on in towns of this size throughout the rural Midwest. This one to me is very interesting in particular because of the view that it provides of the water tower ahead.
Last but not least, it's time to head on over to Harrisburg for the final city that we view in this video. As we enter Harrisburg, notice the very slight levee that we cross, as it's hard to notice from the road as the road is already raised. The levee is right where the Welcome to Harrisburg sign is located. The levee was constructed in reaction to the Ohio River flood of 1937. Keep in mind that we are more than 20 miles from the closest point along the Ohio River to Harrisburg. The middle fork of the Saline River can also flood, and so can the Wabash River to the north and east, with all of those rivers and the low-laying flat farmland that surrounds this area to the south and east. It creates a massive floodplain. The 1937 Ohio River flood left almost all of Harrisburg underwater. That came at the time when the city was also seeing people starting to leave as the coal industry was dying. We'll get more into the coal mining of Harrisburg later. The 1937 flood left only a small part of Harrisburg above water at the town square and left about 10,000 of the residents stuck on that small island for several weeks. 4,000 Harrisburg residents were reported to have been homeless after the event. In 2008, the street that we're driving on, which is called Commercial Avenue, was completely underwater, and so were all of the retail stores that are located off of this stretch. It was considered to be the worst flood in the city since the 1937 flood. On top of all that, an F4 tornado hit the town on February 29th, 2012, causing eight fatalities and 110 injuries. An estimated 40% of the town was affected by the twister, as 200 homes and 25 businesses in Harrisburg were either damaged or destroyed. The main path of the twister also went through the side of the town that we're currently in. You know that rural small town folks love their local Walmart, so I can't show you the town without showing the Walmart. Especially Harrisburg's Walmart, as it is home to the yodeling kid, Mason Ramsey, who had a viral video in 2018 that was sung at this Walmart. Ramsey made it really big when he made an appearance on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Ramsey now has a record deal with Atlantic Records and is the voice of Oliver in Angry Birds 2. Not bad for a 13-year-old kid. Back to Walmart, it's where most of the activity is in many of these small towns, and in some cases, it's the largest largest employer in town. Walmarts in these towns have grown to be of huge cultural significance for almost every small town of Harrisburg size or greater throughout America. In many of these towns, there's nowhere else to go shop and there's nothing else to do for entertainment but to go play Walmart tag. Walmart over time has become the center of many jokes as many of the jokes reference the people that shop there and how the quality of products that are sold are really cheap. Harrisburg's population peaked in 1930 at 16,000, making it the largest city in southern Illinois outside of Metro East. Harrisburg was a boomtown that thrived on the arrival of the railroad, and the coal mining industry was huge here at the time as well. Salt mining activity was also big, and when you count the population of Harrisburg and other nearby coal mining communities, the area's population was 26,000, with 40,000 within all of Saline County, and Saline County today is home to only 24,000. Harrisburg is much like nearby by West Frankfurt when it comes to coal mining, and if you haven't seen that video, you should check it out. As many as 15 coal mines operated here in the early 1900s, and that attracted immigrants from Europe. As the coal mining jobs left, so did the people, and no new industries moved into town to replace the coal mining jobs. With the town being in the state of Illinois, high taxes make economic growth today more of a challenge. It also doesn't help that the town is isolated from major cities and that it's in a major floodplain. To the left, paralleling Main Street on this stretch is a recreational trail called the Tunnel Hill State Trail. It was completed in 1996. With the decline of railroads throughout the U.S., many of them, not just here, have been converted into bike trails.
Harrisburg has a violent crime rate that is a little bit higher than the national average at 563 for every 100,000 residents. Most of those crimes are assaults. The property crime rate is at 3,737 for every 100,000 residents, which is also higher than average. The public schools in Harrisburg are rated as a C on Niche.com, so the city schools seem to be performing at an average rate. This is Harrisburg High School's football field as there seems to have not have been room to build it right next to the high school. The high school's mascot is the Bulldogs. We'll get to the high school towards the end of the video. This is the Illinois Youth Center, which is on the far west part of town. You don't want to be visiting town for that reason. As I mentioned earlier, the Ohio River flood of 1937 put all of Harrisburg underwater except for a small spot of downtown that was on a hill that appeared as an island among all the floodwaters. Right here is that hill. This section of the city is known as Old Harrisburg Village and is where the original town was built. Over time with the coal mining jobs, the city was able to expand.
Here's where the high school is located, which is three blocks east of the football field. I'll head back to the football field before bouncing out of town. The football field is on the left, and if you missed it, I show a better view of the football field at 32 minutes and 12 seconds into the video. Well, that's about it for this video. If you enjoy, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload new and amazing content just like this video. We'll see you next time. Peace!